In certain degrees of York Rite Freemasonry, you have a subsection which is called um, the Royal Arch, Royal Arch Freemasonry. Now, as you can see in the picture, the Royal Arch has a very specific zodiac sign as the, the uh, keystone, the, the top part of the arch. The zodiac being uh, the sign of cancer, the sign that is ruled by the moon, right? The, uh, the yin and the yang aspect of the six and the nine, the male and the female coming together as one in unison. One key aspect about cancer that is um, often overlooked is the concept that uh, the star system Canis Major uh, resides fixed in this constellation. Um, and within this star system, you of course have the binary star system of uh, Sirius A and B. In ancient Egypt, Cancer was symbolized by the scarab beetle holding up um, a carnelian stone or what was symbolized as uh, the solar illumination of the sun reflecting off of the uh, feldspar-based material that the moon is made of. So in this word cancer, we can find uh, the etymological roots of canis and serious, right? Uh, these being uh, the names that some traditions went by. As far as Sirius, um, it was known in Egypt as uh, Sopdet, and in Greek it was known as uh, the star Sothis. Sirius is essentially an initiator of a star. It is, um, it is symbol symbolic of the, um, the dog at the end of the rainbow bridge, right? So the ancient Egyptians believed in uh, something called the Duat, or a portal that led through the sky and uh, as above, so below, it also led within a certain place within you and your uh, quote-unquote underworld. This part in the sky that they saw as the Duat was uh, the constellation of Canis Major, specifically Sirius, and the constellation of Orion. Um, and Sirius and Orion in ancient Egyptian culture, uh, they were known as uh, Isis and Osiris in the sky. So basically, Orion was Osiris and Isis was Sirius. So this keystone on this Freemasonic arch shows the the um the the key point of entrance to this portal out of the cycle of reincarnation, right? So an arch uh, is many things. It's it's a whole symbology essentially, but what it does is it bridges one point to another point, and the symbolism here is seen uh, traditionally as bridging worlds, right? Bridging from the um, the earthly manifest fixed nature back into the more uh, astral transcended, free of bonded, uh, free of bondage type of nature that we uh, essentially ascend to when we activate uh, the light body or the Merkaba. So in this picture, you also see the uh, the sun on the left side and the moon on the right side, uh, symbolizing the divine polarity of creation. You know, the left hemisphere is the masculine logic. That's uh, the emanation or projective energy of the sun. And on the right side, you see the, the moon, you know, the, the right hemisphere of the brain, the creative, more um, feminine, intuitive aspect. Below the arch, you see seven stars, and traditionally these seven stars resemble the seven sisters of the Pleiades, and one of these being uh, a very big key to our, uh, our galaxy, because uh, the galactic center, our central sun, is a star that is located in this constellation uh, known as Alcyon, right, the central sun. Alcyon, etymologically or phonetically, meaning basically all cyon, uh, all cycles in one. So it's it's the the heart of our galactic uh, timekeeping. 
then below these seven stars you can see the um, the shooting star which which is a pentagram uh, pointed downward. Uh, this often gets a lot of negative connotation wrapped around it from dogmatic views. But this uh, inverted pentagram originally meant uh, the earthly manifestation of energy, right? Which is you, which is me, which is everything on this earth plane. It's how you pull things, uh, in a sense, from the astral into physical manifestation. Then, of course, you have, you know, below that, the G, the famous G that's oftentimes depicted actually in the square and compass that's to the right of it. The G being, uh, you know, symbolic of the number seven, the seventh letter. Um, it's symbolic of the practice, the Freemasonic practice of geomancy and geometry. And, of course, uh, the, G, the silent G and the word gnosis. So it's it's a play on words here. Uh that the G is silent in Gnosis because it's it's occult or it's hidden, right? It's not in uh, the pl quote unquote plain sight of what we hear in this word Gnosis. It's hidden, it's to uh, be revealed such as the, the Gnosis is uh, in, in these uh, allegories that we hear about. And that G can also be uh, seen as alluding to uh, the name Germain is in Saint Germain, or the word itself, which means brother, uh, which is what Freemasons, uh, of course, refer to each other as. And finally, for the G, you have Gayatu, uh, a name standing for Grand Architect of the Universe. Though Freemasonry does embrace all religions and creeds and beliefs, uh, traditionally at least at its origins, um, Gayatsu can in some cases be seen as a goat. That goat being the, uh, the uh, figure of Baphomet that the Knights Templar worked with, and uh, that goat also being uh, the Saturn energy of Capricorn. So Capricorn as a zodiac is ruled or governed by the planet Saturn, and Saturn has everything to do uh, astrologically with the concepts of space-time, of order, and of structure. And this is why Freemasonry has a lot to do with Saturn, because it is actually an order that builds structures uh, with the principles of space-time. Time, or the root word temp, uh, being where we get the word temple from. And then real quick, I'd like to jump down to the bottom of this picture specifically. I, I see a lot of emphasis in this part because to the bottom right, you see what is uh, undeniably the Ark of the Covenant, right? And from the word Ark, we get the word Arch, vice versa, you know, spark, Ark, Arch, like an electrical Ark. Anything that arches or arcs or bridges the gap, once again, between two uh, two worlds or two polarities. To the left of that, we see um, a tree. Some do uh, figure this to be uh, an acacia tree, which is a kind of wood that the Ark was made out of. Acacia is very rich in DMT, and um, DMT just so happens to be on a molecular shape, the very similar shape to the constellation of Orion which once again is, is alluding to this, uh, this idea of the duat and this, this uh, portal to the afterlife, or as internal embodiment terms would say, the, uh, the underworld. To the left of that, you have, you know, of course, the, uh, the casket, the symbology of the death, and this is the death of illusion. This is the uh, encapsulation uh, period or basically the cocoon period that we go through a transitional stage in our spiritual rebirth so you know much of this plays out in the story of Lazarus being risen from the dead this also alludes to the resurrection ceremony that has been kept sacred and passed down as a tradition uh, through these preservatory societies such as the Priory of Sion the Knights Templar the Rosicrucians and uh, the Freemasons, just to name a few. This goes further back, you know, 
to the Essenes, the Nazarenes, the uh, the Coptics, um, the Sufis, uh, Pharaonic Egypt, uh, Samaria, you could say back to Atlantis. And really, uh, if you take it back to Lemuria, it's a little bit redundant. Because uh, in Lemuria, uh, from where I stand, we were already in a light body. We had already embodied this, so the practice of this stuff would have been uh, not called for like it was after, the, after uh, we fell from Atlantis. And then, of course, to the left of the casket, you have the, uh, the coiling serpent, symbolizing um, the serpent in the Garden of Eden and the uh, primordial force of energy that rises up the base of the spine uh, that we all know of as Kundalini, right? It's coiled three and a half times around the uh, coccyx or the base of the spine. Now, 3.5 is exactly half of seven, and seven is the basis of how many main chakras we have. We have more than seven, uh, if you start counting all of them. There are different traditions, you know, some say we have 12, some say we have 144, some say we have um, 108 and four that are outside of the body. Um, some say there's 114 total. Um, really uh it's there's various ways to see it it's almost like how many ways can you subdivide a circle you know it's uh it could go on and on as long as uh you're going by the concepts of harmonics and geometry so 3.5 is half of seven and uh seven once again alluding to the seven chakras that the kundalini rises up through um an interesting aspect with the number seven is that uh, its root word is sept. So in these older languages, basically you drop the vowels. So the word sept is, uh, is akin to the word serpent, right? It has the same um, phonetic basis to it. A seven-sided uh, shape, a seven-sided polygon is, you know, called a septagon. And also we get the, uh, the word scepter, right? A staff that energy is risen up through is a scepter. And this, you know, ties back in with the staff being that of the, uh, the spine and the kundalini being risen up the spine, such as how Moses was depicted with a staff or a scepter and a, uh, a serpent coiling up this, this uh, staff that he was holding. So now to trace back to the idea of the Royal Arch and the Ark of the Covenant and this idea regarding the Duat and the Dog Star and all of this melting pot uh, alluding to basically a stargate or a portal uh, to an afterlife. Astrologically, Orion is seen specifically as a shepherd, right, uh, a keeper of a flock. And uh, you could therefore see his dog, uh, that which is next to him, right, his companion, as uh, which is Sirius or Canis Major. You could see that as the uh, as the sheep dog, right, the dog, or the the force that is beckoning the hu uh, humanity back through this duat. Humanity, uh, in biblical terms, even being referred to as the flock or the sheep. And this is not in regards to having a docile state of mind, you know, like you often hear the term sheeple, right? This is this is something different than that. Uh, this also dives into what Jew originally me meant. Jew uh, was pronounced you traditionally. Any J was pronounced with the Y sound uh, in the first place uh, originally. So a U is actually a, a young sheep. And this is where we get the idea of, you know, the ram's horn in Judaism. And this, later the misinterpretations and literalizations started leading to the sacrifice of actual uh, animals, which wasn't really intended uh, initially, but that's, that is kind of what it fragmented into. But uh, the you or the sheep or the Jew being a, a symbol of basically humanity in a state of returning back through the duat and being led by the sheepdog or Sirius back to 
the uh, the shepherd in the sky, which is Orion, uh, or you know, once again in Egypt, Osiris, the uh, this the figure of resurrection, you know, death and rebirth. In the movie The uh, Truman Show, we actually see Jim Carrey's character have his first awakening to the idea that he's in a matrix by the stage light Sirius A, Canis Major, falling out of the sky and him finding it. This stage light was supposed to be uh, basically uh, a star in his fake world and one day, you know, a glitch in the matrix happened essentially and uh, it fell out of the sky and he found it, he turned it over and he started questioning his whole reality from there. So below the belt of Orion, um, you have the Orion Nebula, which is a gaseous cluster. Um, astrally, it's, it's an epicenter for return, you could say. And uh, the word Neb in Egypt meant gold, right? And in these nebulas, it is actually one natural source where gold can manifest from. Gold being a symbol of ascension, right? Uh, it's always trying to escape a magnetic field or, or a field of finitude uh, or compression because it's actually repelled by magnetism. So in the story of Isis and Osiris, she had to reassemble Osiris after he was cut into 14 pieces by his, uh, his jealous brother, Set. And um, one aspect of this that, that fits this uh, Zodi or this uh, this constellation uh, in a fascinating way is is the idea that um, the one part that she had to fashion herself that she couldn't find of his that she you know to remember to reassemble Osiris was actually his phallus and she had to make a golden phallus for him is is how the the uh, the metaphor or the allegory goes so you know below the Orion's belt you have a nebula right the, the the golden cluster and this is the symbolism for you know um, quite literally uh, the ejaculation of sp of spirit into uh, the galaxy and, and the solar system and eventually the earth, right? It shows the like literal gestation and conception or inoculation of the soul being um, projected into this world. There's a star um, in Orion that is uh, supposed to go supernova here uh, really at any time. You know, a lot of these, like how these stars work, you know, if they do go supernova, it, uh, how a lot of these stars work is that when they do go supernova, we don't see it until, you know, hundreds or thousands of years later. So it's all relative to, you know, for us at least, uh, when this is going to appear on Earth, given, you know, space is so vast that it's going to take the speed of light you know, quite some time to travel to where we actually perceive it with our eye. But this, uh, this, this, uh, celestial body in this constellation of Orion that's supposed to go supernova is, uh, Betelgeuse. And you can see it as, uh, you'll see four main stars that kind of stick out the most that frame Orion's belt. And on the top, this top left one that frames that, it's got more of a reddish tint, and it's a little bit brighter than most of the stars in the constellation. And that's, uh, that's Betelgeuse. That's the one that's supposed to uh, go boom in any minute, uh, so they say. In the Rosicrucian um, manifesto from 1618, you see the depiction of the traveling college, uh, what is also known as the Invisible College. And at the top of this depiction, at the very top of the Athenor, uh, you see the word Orions, right? So this is alluding to, uh, you know, the the, uh, the Athenor, or the, the basically the steeple of the Athenor, or the uh, the spire or the needle, uh, being directed to this constellation. And in regards to um, supernovas, there are two more supernovas 
that are supposed to occur. One actually has already occurred, um, and that was in uh, what some refer to as the 13th Zodiac. That's up for debate, depending on what your school of belief is. But uh, that's aside the point for right now. This this uh, Ophiuchus right uh, constellation is where one of these supernovas took place, and this was just recent. This was uh, in on August 8th in 2021. So actually, right on the day of what some uh, celebrate as Lion's Gate, the Lion's Gate portal, this uh, this star was perceived by us to to be supernova. So it went, it actually imploded, you know, hundreds of years ago, but the visible effects uh, came into play uh, last year. And then after that, the next one that is to go supernova is uh, the star in Cygnus, a star in Cygnus. And Cygnus is the swan constellation. So you have the, the, the Ophiuchus constellation, where it's the man uh, bearing the serpent, right? And then you have the Ophiuchus constellation, or the, uh, excuse me, the Cygnus constellation, which is the swan. And you see these two, uh, these two constellations in this depiction of the, the uh, invisible college as well. You see them to the left and the right of the Athenor, as you can see in the picture here. Now, when this final uh, star goes supernova, it's, it has been uh, prophesied by Rosicrucians and Freemasons of the past that this is when this line of uh, preservatory societies is going to come back out to uh, the forefront and start um, re reinstating its... Um, its practices and really start spreading uh, a lot of occult science that uh, that really through Gnostic traditions and practices we all can tap into from within our own internal resources and connection with the divine. But um, but this knowledge is also going to be uh, broadcasted in a different way at some point. And this is in a way that is um, for the masses to basically uh, have some deeper food for thought than what uh, you know previous society has kind of uh, um, displayed. This essentially uh, can be seen as the prelude to a another renaissance, another revolution or breakthrough in science, music, art, philosophy. Uh, storytelling, playwright, and, and so on and so forth. So the Rosicrucians are, in, in one sense, you could say they're the alchemical branch of Freemasonry. Uh, the, the, all these groups, once again, they're, you could kind of categorize them all as what some call the, the Great White Brotherhood, uh, if you wish to call it that, but it's, it's really one preservatory that is uh, keeping uh, this this kind of knowledge set alive and trying to uh, keep the freedom of speech and expression about it alive, to where it's not snuffed out completely by the uh, by the essentially the corrupted uh, aspects of the church. Science at one point was um, was suppressed and it was hoarded to be only, only um, acknowledged and even known of by the quote-unquote higher class or hierarchy uh, of the time, right? Those who, who were, the, you know, self-proclaimed royals or th who thought, you know, if they had a certain kind of blood flowing through their veins that were privy, more privy than uh, you and I to uh, this, this sort of knowledge. Well, this, uh, this acknowledgement of science returned to the surface and uh, a big group to thank for this is actually the, uh, the British Royal Society of Science, which, uh, which even claims itself to have stemmed from a group of philosophers 
and scientists that went by the traditions of the Invisible College, uh, i.e. the Rosicrucians. So we can see that the Rosicrucians were the behind the scenes push that actually pushed the teaching and practice of the sciences back into uh, the public eye where, where uh, the common man, or for lack of a better word, the layman, would, uh, would have a chance at, uh, you know, coming across this kind of information. You know, the, the more objective, uh, provable, solid, tangible aspects uh, and knowledge sets that uh, we collect about nature itself. I think it should be emphasized, too, that science is essentially spirituality demystified. And the beautiful thing about science is that it is, it is objective, so it's something that we all can agree upon. You know, if something happens before our eyes, uh, yeah, perception can always steer the show, too. And we all can see the same thing and perceive somewhat of a different take, but through certain scientific rigor, you know, and application and study, we can land on consensus agreements about the reality of uh, nature and uh, creation itself. And this can create a kind of unification that really uh, what we could round off as, you know, the, 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 the corrupted corporate power structure that still rules to this day, uh, largely, i.e. The, the corrupted Roman Catholic Church. This is something they wouldn't want. Uh, they, they want the divide and conquer still, you know. So anything that's going to get us all on the same page, you know, in the way that science potentially could, if taught in a, you know, certain way or context, is something that is uh, not really in the favor of uh, the Vicar of Christ, you could say, right? The stand-in or that which is trying to uh, be the bridge or intermediary between uh, the, the perceiver and the divine. So to conclude this video, you know, we, we took it through the, uh, the York Rite uh, kind of uh, tradition of the uh, Royal Arch Freemasonry and uh, the bridging between two worlds, the merging of two polarities, and how this ties in with the Duat and our transition through this bondage state uh, to the other side essentially of the veil, right? And how this was a tradition and a practice and uh, a spiritual cultivation that had been harnessed and preserved throughout uh, thousands of years by various different traditions, even religions, groups, sects, uh, bloodlines, and so forth. I stated a lot of things here as fact, and uh, as always, my disclaimer is this. It's all fiction until it resonates in the chest. <laughs>